All right, well, so let's just skip through and get to the operational update. Obviously, as usual, we have a million details in the, um, in the document here for you, but just some of the highlights for us. Um, big things from the month of October uh, that we are discovering. <laughs> uh, for us, um, DrupalCon net income was a real highlight. Uh, we know that DrupalCon's had a tough year. Uh, in terms of sponsorship revenue, and uh, a lot of that anecdotally is is tied to you know the D8 release being a little bit slow, um, and that was tough. Uh, and yet, uh, Rachel and her team did a really good job managing the con experience and keeping our costs to a minimum. So we actually stayed on budget uh, for our con net revenue, and that is a really big win for us. It would have made a tough year a lot tougher without that. So. Um, I just really wanted to highlight that and just thank um, Rachel and her team, Tim and Amanda um, and uh, Tina for making that possible for us. So that was a huge win for us uh, to get to that point and know that uh, last month. Um, another key thing from last month that has really been helpful is uh, we finally have faster Drupal.org dev environments. This is something that Angie asked me for from the first day I took the job and three years later, look, you guys, look. <laughs> we did it. Um, and this is this is huge. It's a really it's a really big challenge for anyone on staff, let alone in the community, um, to have to wait for three or four hours for that dev environment to spin up. Um, and so with with CI winding down, um, Archie on our team in particular was able to spend some time on this and now uh, it takes about 10 minutes to spin up a dev environment and so that should be really helpful. Um, context for the conversation that we're going to have later too uh, about working groups. Yeah, let me throw out a, a props to Ricardo Amaro who jumped in during DrupalCon Barcelona uh, to work on it as well and then was able to hand that work back off to Archie. So it was kind of a Archie started it, handed it off to a community member, picked it back up again. Um, it's really cool. Look at us working with the community. It's all awesome it. and stuff. Yeah. Uh, good. And then we've also obviously spent a lot of time working on the D8 launch, which in case you were unaware, it's happening tomorrow, our time. Or today if you're Donna, because she lives in the future. <laughs> um, Yay! <laughs> yep. Yay! <laughs> yeah, so we've been working a lot on the, the date lunch, um, particularly like our comms team over here, Bradley, Liz, um, Emily, Tatiana, Jacob, really the whole engineering team, but I think Emily and Tatiana in particular right now have done a really good job of pulling together all the resources for that for that launch. And so um, just to give you a couple of highlights about what's happening tomorrow on Drupal.org and around the community, um, we have um, a new Drupal 8 landing page, which will launch tomorrow at Drupal.org slash 8, which I'm really excited about because URLs with hyphens in them are dumb. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I'm really happy about that. Uh, so we have a brand new landing page with uh, a look and feel that's complete. Um, I think it's Drupal, but it is divorced from the Drupal.org uh, look and feel at this point. Um, I like to think amicably separated. They, yes. <laughs> conscious uncoupling. It was a conscious <laughs> uncoupling, yes. Uh, but that look and feel is uh, uh, significantly updated for this landing page, and it looks great. We're really excited about it. Um, we are looking to carry that over into the header of Drupal.org for the launch uh, because we don't want that page to feel completely different. Um, and we want to make sure that the Drupal 8 launch is front and center, so that will actually be in the header update um, that we're planning. Um, and the home page will have some changes that go along with that. So that's coming out. Um, the home page and the press release that is on there um, have been out. Uh, the text there has been out for a little while, so we're working on translations for all of those. Um, I think uh, this morning we were at 17 or 18 translations of the press release so far, um, and we can continue to accommodate more as they roll in. Uh, we have some I made Drupal 8 badges for people to help share on social media and you know sharing on the fun, obviously. And uh, we'll also have a new improved download experience for Drupal Core that rolls out as well tomorrow. So when you go to get Drupal 8, um, you're actually going to get some context about which version you would choose and why. Um, so that's that's really fantastic. Um, and it also uh, will highlight uh, one of our partners as well on that page. And then on the social side, uh, Paul Johnson um, and Jam and a few others, uh, I think those are the two big uh, Spearheads have put together Celebrate D8, uh, a website that is going to help us um, 
celebrate D8. So there, Paul is handling all the sort of unofficial activities. Um, if you use the hashtag celebrate D8, you'll be able to track the parties that happen around the world. And there have been, I think there's about 200 parties even now um, that are listed on Drupacal. Um, so people are posting their parties on groups.drupal.org. Those are getting scraped in. Um, and we have um, all the continents but Antarctica covered at this point. Which is I'm working great. on Antarctica. I've asked the Australian Antarctic um, service to at least raise a glass to us. All right. <laughs> that is awesome. That would be amazing to just have that one one little icon on Antarctica would be amazing. I can't promise anything, but I have at least, I've at least put in the call. <laughs> That's amazing. Yep. So, so yeah, so it's been a very, um, it's been a very busy uh, few weeks leading up to that, but we are all um, running, running on adrenaline and excitement at this point. We're really and thrilled. Oh, also caffeine, right? To get to tomorrow. Waffles. We're running and waffles. waffles too. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get there. Any questions about those things before I move on to a couple of things to watch? Um, <clears throat> not a question, but a statement. Your Celebrate D8 video, the DA video, is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all Holly editing. <laughs> it was adorable. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it got me out of having to go to hockey practice on Sunday, so it was totally worth it. <laughs> Um, we enjoyed making that. Other questions about the launch or anything else right now? Okay, so a couple of things to watch from October. Um, one is the membership campaign. Um, it's both a highlight and a thing to watch. Um, as you know, we've had a banner up on Drupal.org. Uh, and we have been, uh, you know, aggressively pursuing, pursuing uh, memberships. Uh, and the goal was to hit a thousand memberships and a hundred thousand dollars of revenue. And we picked those numbers out of thin air because we've never done this before. So um, there's lots of wins there. Um, if we look at October of 2015 compared with October 2014, we had 116% uh, increase in memberships. So that's awesome. Uh, what we learned is, you know, putting the banner up definitely does call attention to it. Um, and it's definitely pushing our, our numbers up. And in terms of the number of memberships sold, both new and renewed, it's been, um, at, the, at the time of writing this, it was around 400 memberships um, of the thousand goals. So the number of memberships is pacing pretty well, um, but revenue is coming in under. We just hit, we're close to $25,000 now. Um, part of that is, a big part of that is people choosing the smaller than suggested membership fee. Um, but we have about six weeks left in the campaign, um, and this will run through the launch. So we know that uptick in um, attention will help there. And we have some additional experiments planned for later to see what we can do about that. But, you know, it, it's a learning time, and this is all revenue that is um, was not in our budget. So it's, uh, it just, you know, it doesn't hurt us that we're not meeting our goal. Um, this was a, a campaign that we launched. Uh, you know, basically for testing purposes. So, so that's it um, on the on the membership side. And then performance to budget, we continue to watch this, and we'll have some more um, candid talk about numbers in executive session as we do uh, before before we're able to release things out to the public, obviously. Um, but uh, we see some really good things um, on on the budget side. Um, a couple of things I do want to highlight is that we are about to hit the adjusted supporting partner goal. So, you know, we did a budget revision in, in June, basically, um, and uh, supporting partners, that program was something that had been significantly behind, um, but we did a good job of finding the place where it should be because we're about to hit it. That's great. Um, and I do want to point out that's still about a 20% growth in that program year over year. So we feel really good about that. Um, and then we'll have some updates about um, the new business model shift uh, as well in the executive session, but things are looking really good there. We've had a ton of just really fascinating conversations and some that have been actually really promising as well. So that's, that's that, but we're still trying to be cautious. So that's my update. Any other questions there? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Uh, 
So our next agenda item would be committees. Is there anything to discuss from the committee business? I think not, but we'll pause and check. The finance committee met yesterday. Good point. Good point. And so we'll be able to discuss those numbers in executive session. Okay. All right, next up, late addition to the board meeting. Um, as you may be aware, Angie, um, Angie's term ended and she stepped down from her board role, uh, which is sad. Um, but uh, she also, uh, in addition to just being board member, was secretary of the board, and we do need to fill that role. Uh, and so uh, the executive committee reached out to Mike Lamb, who agreed to play that role just in time for this meeting. <laughs> That's why I added this here. Um, do you want to provide any more context, Tiffany, or, or help us kick off what happens next? Yeah, I'll just um, make a motion to um, appoint Mike Lamb, Secretary of the Drupal Association. I'll second the motion. Okay, so Tiffany, Tiffany puts the motion out there and Donna seconds. Uh, so, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Aye. And it'll be fun to ask any opposed now that our cameras work in this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I just figured out how to turn off the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not opposed, right, Denise? <laughs> well, I was Thanks, feeling everybody. a little bit like, I was feeling a little bit like somebody on a Disneyland, I was sort of a disembodied face. So, fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, Mike Lamb, thanks for stepping up and filling in this role. No problem. Thank you, everybody. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for doing that. That's great. Yeah. No problem. Mike, you you have to write the minutes with a Welsh accent, though. <laughs> Yeah, I'm nervous after uh, Angie's minutes. Let's see if I can. Uh, let's see if I can do this. You you don't have to do them like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, it, it'd, be, it'd be helpful if you were a little terse compared to Angie. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. Go and, and to point out, you only really have to do them at retreats and in executive session now because uh, Elise thankfully takes care of them for our uh, Thank normal. You. Thank you, Elise. <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, let's move on to the next bit, which is the DrupalCon Barcelona review. Um, so, Rachel, I, I know you are in an airport lounge. <laughs> are yes, you, I am. Yeah, are you able to grab control and? Uh, I'll need yeah, to I think I need you to. I think I need you to stop sharing the screen, and then I can share my screen. Right, hands up! I think it's you. Okay. Uh, let's try this. Can you see the slide? Almost. It says Almost. That you start at screen seven. Got it. Yay. Okay. Can we see them now? Yes. Yay. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the team and I put together a little recap for everyone on DrupalCon Barcelona. Um, it was only about six weeks ago, although it feels about six months ago <laughs> at this point. Um, so let's just jump right in and no, let's see if this is it, going to work. It does take a long time for your slides to work. So if you want me to switch over and drive the slides, it might go a little faster. Okay. Um, that may be needed. It looks like it's not really working. Yeah, I think, I think we'll have to do that. <laughs> okay, let me, <laughs> I'll stop sharing so you can. Okay, sorry about that. That airport Wi-Fi is not top notch. <laughs> <laughs> What? No, it's not. What airport are you in, Rachel? Where are you in the um, world? I, can't, I cannot share that right now. Oh. oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, trace route to Rachel. Uh -huh. <laughs> Looks like Waikiki. <laughs> I wish. You're in Philadelphia, right? <laughs> yeah, I totally. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, it's going slow for me now. Actually, too. that would be really good. Can we do that? Um, Hawaii is really close to me. <laughs> I think we should. Uh, we can totally come to Hawaii. I think that's a great idea. Excellent. Okay. 
I am now sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Did you hear what she said? She said, come to. No, like, like she confirmed that she was there. Like, <laughs> like go to. If she wasn't there, she would have said, we could totally go to Hawaii. She said, we could totally come to Hawaii. I'm, I'm already there. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Trolling DrupalCon locations is the best part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So let's just jump right in. So we've got a little agenda here, similar to what we've seen in the past. We'll take everyone through the demographics and financials. Um, talk about some of the marketing efforts that our team put together with some great community volunteers, and then uh, recap some of the, the content as far as sessions, keynotes, what kind of thing goes. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we ended up at 2,039 conference attendees, which is really fabulous. We um, originally thought maybe we'd be as low as like 17 or 1,800, not really knowing kind of what effect um, Drupal 8 would have, the release or delayed release of Drupal 8 would have, um, but we felt really, really good about the number that we ended up at. Um, we did see quite a few one-day tickets, which is kind of exciting. I uh, got a lot of local community members in, and we had another strong business summit. Our training numbers went down slightly, but that's to be expected, what with um, Drupal 8's pending release. Um, okay, so these are our breakdowns as far as job titles and the experience level. Um, as far as the experience level goes, it pretty much stayed exactly the same as Amsterdam. Um, we slightly shifted a couple people from beginner to an intermediate and advanced, which is really exciting. And with our new registration system, we started asking people if this is their first time at DrupalCon, and we recorded that number at 34%. So that's kind of exciting to see that we're getting a lot of fresh blood into the DrupalCon system. Fresh blood. Yeah, fresh blood. <laughs> um, so we saw a lot of people were coming to us from agencies, which is not uh, super shocking, although we also saw a great uh, number coming from site owners themselves. Um, and as far as the rest, it's kind of split across the board. Next slide. Um, the industries represented is a great uh, indicator of the health. We did allow people to, to select multiple answers, and as many Drupalists uh, are aware, they're, they're kind of dabble in multiple industries. So um, it's, it's kind of cool to see just how big the reach is and how solid we, we have a foothold in, you know, nonprofit, ed, government, and obviously tech. Next slide. Uh, the top 10 countries represented, it, it stayed fairly similar to what we saw in Amsterdam, other than ne the Netherlands dropped from the first place spot. Uh, other than that, the, the breakdown seemed uh, to be pretty much in line with what we saw last year. Next slide. Uh, so now we get into the meat of uh, the details, the, the financials and how the, the con shapes up. Uh, we ended up with essentially a $75,000 net positive uh, right. income. Or excuse me, yes. 75,000 euro uh, uh, net income, which is fabulous. Um, we spent some time at the beginning of this year looking at uh, some updated um, attendance forecasting and also some correcting some budgeting errors that we found. And that that had been projected as low as like 100, a negative 100 to 150,000 at one point. So to see it not only be uh, neutral, but also slightly positive is a really, um, really encouraging thing. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so our conference tickets ended up really strong. Um, again, we had some training tickets that, that was a little bit lower than what we'd hoped for, but again, not, not anything that was too shocking based on the delayed uh, D8 release. And our sponsorship revenue did come in lower than what we had been hoping for. But if you go to the next slide, uh, we were able to manage the expenses um, extremely well in order to not make it too much of a financial liability to the association. Um, and still provide a pretty strong experience for the attendee goers. So this is a general breakdown of how all of the expenses um, laid out. You go to the next slide. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, financial lessons learned this year. Um, obviously we had a bit of a, a financial um, extra level of scrutiny uh, with the budget. And what we looked, found was there were some, uh, some points in our contracts that we could have negotiated a little bit stronger to put us in a more flexible place. Um, we also found a, calculate, a couple calculation errors in some of our original budget estimates. Um, and we, we did, had looked at what our attendance forecast was, and it was kind of like, oh, we're, we're just going to keep getting bigger. The con will always keep growing. And we found that, you know, when we're waiting for a new product to come out, which may or may not come out by the time of the con, um, it's a little bit tough to accurately forecast that. Um, so we, we definitely found that there was a large local boost by having our con last year in Amsterdam. 
Um, and so we corrected that uh, in our forecast and we were able to get to a much better place of forecasting where we had hoped to come in. And again, we beat where we um, forecasted coming in. So we felt really good about that. Uh, next slide. Um, the team itself worked extremely hard to make sure that we um, found any saving opportunity that we could without detracting from the experience for the attendees or pulling away from the, the content of the show. Um, so uh, we wanted to kind of list out some of the different ways that we found to um, make that number a little bit more black than red. And some of those were um, the Triple Association staff doubled up on hotel rooms, and we also reduced uh, the number of staff attending. Uh, and with that, the staff and vendors and also some of our service providers took on additional work. Um, so we worked with a much leaner crew um, and had people volunteering in roles that they normally would not be, <laughs> which was great. Um, we also restructured our space usage uh, and released a few rooms early. So uh, a key example would be the exhibit hall. We were able to release one of our days with the exhibit hall, and um, our sponsors were kind and uh, uh, gracious enough to set up in one day and uh, in half a day, actually. And that, that uh, yielded a, quite a bit of savings for us. Um, we also found opportunities where we weren't using some of our session rooms, um, and, and we were able to release those and, and recap um, some of those fees. Uh, we also looked at some of the um, components of the con that weren't uh, driving revenue. So, for example, the community summit, and we revamped that and turned it into community kickoff. Um, and as we will see later, that had a really great, um, really, uh, really boosted the uh, approval rating of that event, uh, which will show in the survey results. Uh, we also reduced our plan for conference branding throughout the venue. So we tried to consolidate the branding that we had in the front of the um, in the front of the lobby so that when people walked in, they really had that kind of wow impact uh, right there. And then we utilized the um, digital signs that, that the venue had uh, included in our, in our program. Uh, we also explored an alternative keynote speaker format for the third day. Um, we had the community keynotes, which went over really well. And so that worked out uh, good on, on both sides, both financially and from a programming standpoint. And we negotiated with the catering department to have a seasonal menu, so um, allowing the chef to come up with a menu, you know, a couple weeks before the con rather than um, agreeing to something a year or six months out. And we tried to um, improve or increase that uh, meal experience for the guests by also offering soup. Um, we also did a bunch of ticket promotions to drive potential attendees, so uh, not necessarily cutting a, an expense, but trying to boost revenue um, through some direct email marketing. And then when it came time to order uh, registration supplies, we did our best to um, order on the more conservative side, but within the um, numbers that we were pro projected our forecasted attendance to be. Next slide. Any, well, any questions about that? Um, okay, marketing. So our marketing team uh, did not have a large paid advertising budget for this con, so we didn't really do the promoted tweets or posts. Um, we really focused on um, creating and delivering content. Uh, across the various channels. Um, so the con team, it, our, we put together quite a bit of content on our own and utilized um, a lot of volunteers. And our marketing uh, department did a great job of helping us push that out and uh, making sure that the social media volunteers knew what was going on uh, in order to kind of get that out, out into the world. Um, and we also created some resources that were, um, some of the more successful pieces were a little bit more about how to experience Barcelona, where to go, where to eat, that kind of thing. Excellent. Um, so again, we found that our content marketing, um, the blog traffic does not get a lot of uh, traffic on the site. However, it is syndicated to a lot of other um, news aggregators. That's really great. It's another way for us to get that information out. And you can see a list there of our top performing blog posts. Next slide. As far as email marketing goes, uh, we have a very high uh, open rate, which is fabulous. And our highest uh, open email was one with a bring a friend coupon. So inviting people to um, invite someone they know to come to the uh, con with them. Next slide. Um, we did, I mentioned earlier, we did some email promotions to try and drive um, attendance. We uh, used the two tactics uh, that we try, or the two strategies that we tried in um, uh, Los Angeles, where we um, asked people who had already registered to invite a friend. We find that people tend to um, be more likely to accept if they know a friendly face that will be there. So we gave them a special coupon code for like 50 euros off for their friends. And then uh, we also did a direct uh, email campaign to people who had registered for DrupalCon in the past but had not yet registered for this DrupalCon. Uh, we uh, also offered a training discount that uh, provided a discount if people purchased a training ticket as well as a, a DrupalCon ticket. And we worked with the local community to give them um, a discount code for some uh, reduced price single day tickets. 
Next slide. Uh, yeah, we want to definitely say thank you to Paul Johnson and Christina and Pedro. Uh, they did an amazing job of uh, manning the, the social media helm for well over <laughs> the immediate months before uh, the con. And we have got a lot of really great feedback about people um, being excited when their, their tweets were retweeted by them or their, their things are being highlighted uh, across the channel. Uh, next slide. So overall, we found what, that the community really responds well to large news, news announcements and less well to deadline reminders. Um, so we think that this is a real opportunity to run some experimental campaigns in Dublin around news. Um, it also would give us the opportunity to possibly sell association memberships to promote some of the other programmatic offerings that the DA uh, provides. Uh, the community also seems to be extremely hungry for the behind the scenes information about the con. So, you know, who our local team is, what we're doing as far as branding goes, and uh, what we do to kind of produce the event. Um, it's kind of unexplored for us, and it's something that we can really develop on. We've kind of got a couple blog post ideas um, outlined for next year, and so um, I, the community is always hungry for transparency, and we share whatever we can uh, when we can, but we're going to uh, kind of structure a more proactive way of communicating that out next year. Next slide. Uh, so here we have a list of the highest attended sessions. Uh, Drupal 8 tops the list. <laughs> Next slide. And Drupal 8 tops the list again of top ranked sessions. So Morton's session on theming was our, our highest ranked session. Fine. Uh, so we got quite a bit of feedback from um, session evaluations. And one of the things that we found uh, people really were hungry for is kind of knowing a little bit more at the beginning of the session or before they even got to the session. So understanding what the goals of the session um, are and what they can expect to learn. Um, we also found that people really uh, appreciated uh, presenters that had easy to follow uh, presentation decks that were really organized and they loved hearing about real life examples. Uh, that kind of honest uh, insight really gave them extra credibility with the attendees. Um, people also appreciated when the speaker took the time at the beginning of the session to kind of get to know the audience, ask them a few questions about, you know, who's the developer, who's the or that kind of thing. Um, and that we found uh, quite a few things that uh, people were asking for more of. Um, so for next year, we can ask uh, or work with our speakers to um, show, not tell when presenting. So a little bit less about slide reading and a little bit more um, interaction. Um, kind of formatting it around more of a conversation rather than a formal presentation. And again, just working on the accuracy as far as the session title and description, making sure that people are really clear on what they know they're going to find out when they attend the session. Um, and they, they really were looking for those insightful, profound moments of things that really made them think about something in a new or uh, innovative way. Next slide. The really exciting thing, though, is we had 89% of the people um, who filled out evaluations said that they did learn something uh, and that they can use in real life. So that's great. Um, we averaged session evaluations that had at least five um, evals, and they averaged to be 3.91 out of five, which is good. And again, these are just kind of our next steps for next year. Um, we want to work on the experience levels for sessions. We found that sometimes the uh, session uh, experience level didn't quite match what people found when they got to the session. Um, and working on track icons that relate a little bit more closely to the content of the track um, are Uh, also working on a more um, mobile-friendly way to evaluate sessions after the uh, session is attended. Sprints. We had a really great sprinters turnout in Barcelona. Uh, we had 25% of sprinters attend on Friday, which is fabulous. Um, we also had uh, very well attended extended sprints. We went to a great venue called Makers of Barcelona, and people were um, they really appreciated the level of care that the mentors were able to give them and uh, learning how to sprint and learning how to sprint more. And uh, it was, it was uh, something that came through very strongly on the evaluations. And uh, one thing that they noted that they would like, okay, sorry, one thing that they noted they'd want a little bit more of is um, uh, mentors with, I think it was a, a trying, trying to get them more from advanced to um, intermediate to advanced. Um, as far as the attendee survey goes, the top three reasons to attend uh, session content, personal networking, and build my Drupal skills. Next slide. And we saw that things pretty much stayed the same as far as um, expectations from Barcelona to Amsterdam. The, the only things that uh, we had a, a larger shift on were um, kind of related around hiring. So people looking for jobs, people looking to hire people. Um, but for the most part, everything else was, um, was kind of in line with what we saw last year. Um, as far as activities go, we saw that um, 
there were kind of two themes of things that were really, really useful. The first kind of theme was around the social and community aspects of it. So networking, sprints, and social events were really highly rated. And then the next thing was uh, kind of chunk was around uh, programming. So sessions, boss, and keynotes were also really uh, ranked useful. Next slide. Um, so the things that we saw a little a bit of a decline on were the value of the sessions, um, the business showcase, and the exhibit hall. Um, but the notable improvements we had were um, around the contribution sprints and keynotes. Um, people really loved the community keynotes. Um, and the community kickoff was really highly rated. I think you can see that right in the uh, middle right. Um, the networking, e-newsletters, and trainings were additionally uh, areas where we showed improvement. Next slide. Uh, so this is great. We saw quite a few people are likely to recommend DrupalCon to a colleague, which is something that we always like to see. And we have a very small amount of people who would be not likely at all to recommend. So overall from the survey, um, people basically are there to attend and hear the sessions. They would like to expand their skills and network, um, both professionally and personally. Um, they're asking for an even higher quality level of session and working with uh, the speakers to ensure that they're really clear on what it is that they're getting out of these sessions. The keynotes uh, and social events were ranked the highest as uh, favorite moments. And we got a lot of really great feedback on our badge pickup. Uh, we had some of the best temps we've worked with in Barcelona. They were really great and super helpful. And uh, we were really happy with the registration setup. Next slide. So overall, just some uh, production takeaways that we had. Um, we as a team have been really focusing on operations and uh, procedures this year, which doesn't sound super splashy, but it's super helpful to, to free up time to work on other things uh, to make the cons even greater. So one of the things that we found uh, for next year that could be really helpful is better communicating the VAT refund policies to avoid confusion. Um, the, the VAT is something that is a bit out of our control, and so we work to support people as best we can, but just finding ways to make it easier for them to understand would be helpful. Um, we want to continue to streamline the online registration process, making it easier for people to um, create uh, reports internally uh, and, and issue uh, reg lists. Uh, the on-site check-in process for the summits and trainings worked really well. Uh, we've had issues in the past where people have kind of crashed the trainings or summits, lunches, and uh, we've run out of food for the people who paid to be there. So we, we found some uh, new uh, new ways of handling that this year in, in Barcelona that worked really well, and we want to continue those. Um, we also want to uh, develop a process internally to work with our vendors and service providers and have them review our code of conduct and make sure that they're really clear on what, what those um, standards are. Uh, we also saw uh, some interesting Wi-Fi issues, which I'm sure everybody was aware of. We had um, some real, uh, some really <laughs> interesting and unique attacks on the system on Monday, uh, which uh, was a fun challenge for our tech team. Um, we found that there was a whole new type of attack that they hadn't actually seen before. So that's kind of great. <laughs> and we actually saw a lot of inter interference from people's um, network-enabled devices, so for instance, like smartwatches um, and people building MiFi's to kind of boost their system uh, for their own uh, use, it really took down the larger system uh, for the greater attendee base. Yeah, Rachel, and just to be clear, because I know this is a sticking point for so many folks, it's, uh, it's not just internet-enabled devices, it's the preponderance of Bluetooth devices. So the watches, the keyboards, like the, you know, just the amount of peripherals that people are tethering via Bluetooth to their phone and laptop uh, is causing a tremendous amount of noise on the network. So. Yeah, it's something that, and it was something that the way the structure of it was, was something that our techs had not seen before. Um, and so that's something that we may have to look at for future cons of ways to either um, ask people to reduce that interference or possibly uh, maybe leave those extra devices at home if they're not absolutely necessary. Uh, but we will stay on top of that. Next slide. So in summary, uh, we felt like attendees really loved Barcelona uh, as a conference location. The, the festival La Marseille was uh, great and everybody really seemed to enjoy taking part in all the festivities. Um, the local community that we worked with in Barcelona was fabulous and they put together such a gracious welcome uh, to the larger community with their wonderful welcome party on, on Tuesday evening. Uh, the Wi-Fi issues obviously really impacted our trainings and summits on Monday and some of the sprints on Monday and a little bit on Friday. Um, and that was definitely like our number one complaint takeaway. Um, we also felt that we had a really good approach to the new way of delivering community content with the community kickoff, boss, and trainings. Um, we got really great feedback on that, and we think that there's ways we can continue to improve on that. Um, but we, we found that that uh, new kind of unconference style worked really well. Thanks to Donna and Holly and Adam and everyone who worked on that. 
And uh, we are identifying quite a few ways that we can just provide a better holistic con experience. So it's, again, this goes back to that expectation setting within um, like individual sessions, but also finding ways to help people uh, navigate their ways through the con. So finding the sessions that are going to um, make the biggest impact for them and figuring out what kind of experience they want to have. Um, and that kind of ties into the last one where we can um, continue to evolve how we communicate the value of the con. So um, just kind of telling people about what it is that we do to try and, um, you know, do the best that we can uh, to maximize the value that they get out of the money they pay for their, their ticket. So all the different things we do to reduce the cost and, and keep those ticket prices as low as possible. Um, so going forward, we're going to be working with um, uh, revamping a little bit of our programming. So working with the speakers and track chairs to ensure that the expectations are clear and uh, looking into uh, what content we could possibly curate. Um, again, focusing on creating a holistic conference experience, so providing suggested schedules based on roles or providing a little bit uh, of a more robust first-time experience before the con actually starts. Um, we want to make sure that the, that the content and the program of the con really match the demographics as they continue to grow and evolve with the Drupal community, especially if we see big boosts from Drupal 8, which we hope to. And we also heard that the alternative keynotes were a big hit, um, so people loved hearing um, from Mike and David, and uh, we'd really love to keep that type of format going forward. Um, it was wonderful because those were two sessions that all of our track uh, chairs really loved, but they just didn't quite fit into our normal track chair format. And when we were able to come up with this uh, community keynote, it, it just really resonated. And then obviously Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. So we had a lot of learnings that came out of uh, Barcelona with all the different interferences and attacks on our firewall system. Um, and so we're going to take that into our um, experience with Dublin and uh, work with them really proactively ahead of time to make sure that we can avoid as much of that as possible and hopefully all of it. But we'll see. Slide. And so now it's onward to Dublin. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I just got a couple of comments, um, Rachel, and they, these have been bubbling around in my head for a long time. Is if we're going to be revamping the program, can we can we look at one less tracks? That we less just, tracks, sure. Uh, we just don't run as, as many. Um, two, I think we we really need to institute a bit of well, policy is a strong word, but some people present more than once. And I don't know that that's, you know, I think we should, that should be a, 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 an extreme but maybe normal situation. And mm -hmm. then the last one is a suggestion for feedback, which I've seen at another event, which is to have um, staff at the doors on the way out with just a big iPad with a, with three, with, you know, red, yellow, green, basically traffic light. And as people walk out, they just hit whether or not it was, you know, great, terrible or meh. And, and that's really quick and gets a lot more, um, gets a, uh, your volume up for feedback. So I'm done. Yeah, you know what's interesting is I looked into a system like that. There's this uh, provider called Happy or Not, but I don't know if you've seen them in airports where you can kind of do that. There's like little kiosks and you push buttons. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately, we just didn't have the money to do that this year. But I, I, I love the idea of doing that. I think that um, that's an easy way we can get additional feedback. We just want to find a way to get um, people to still fill out those evaluations. Because I know those speakers really value that the more detailed that's feedback true. about like their individual sessions. So I think it'd be a great way to have a hybrid um, mm. between the two. I've seen really low tech versions of that as well. Work at conferences yeah. where they have like the goldfish bowl and the colored balls, and you just put your you pick one color. Yeah. Oh, cool. Hey, Ray. hey, Rachel and, and Holly. <laughs> um, the as you as you know, Wi-Fi has a part is is in part due to location, 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 right? Um, some cities it's harder, some buildings it's harder. <clears throat> but um, I who does Wi-Fi for South by Southwest, and I promise you, they they've got way, you know an exponentially huger problem with um, Bluetooth crosstalk, but they still managed to pull it off. So if you guys want to talk to him, that's easy to do. Yeah, that'd be great. We work with a really great team out of England, actually, that does um, Apple's events all over the world. And um, we haven't had that, we didn't have that issue at all in Los Angeles. So it's really interesting to me. I don't know if it was um, the specific equipment that was installed in Barcelona or something with the network. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. We have a full report that we're debriefing on, um, but I would love to get anybody else's insights on that so that we can do everything we can to not have that issue in the future. So I would love to connect with you on that. Good, yeah, that's just a really, it's a huge problem for technical conferences, especially for tutorials and stuff, so. And yeah. second, second, second point, um, Ofcon has for many years offered speaker training 
to new speakers, especially to new speakers. They, they offer it to everybody, but they, they outreach to people they've never actually seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we can have a conversation about that as well. I don't know if it's worth it. They usually offer it during the tutorial. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to plan on your tutorial, people already knowing what they're doing. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, I think it has over the years created an incrementally better speaker experience at Oscon. So um, anyway, we can talk about that too, if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. I know we, we've evolved the way we work with our speakers um, over the years. So I know for a while, I think Emma Jane was providing one-on-one um, -on -one outreach and training on that. And then we kind of evolved to having a training video that people could use. Um, we, we rely a lot on the track leads to kind of be in communication with their speakers and, and work with them on, on areas where they may need extra assistance. Um, but I think that that's one thing that Amanda, who uh, is kind of at the helm of our, our programming and content, she identified pretty quickly, like, that's an easy way for us to kind of, you know, uplevel that quality that people are looking for, especially for people that this may be their first big speaking opportunity. Yeah, that would be great. It's, it's good for the community because it's, it's, as a technologist, it's pretty hard to get decent, uh, how to do a good talk coaching. Yeah. So, um, so, so anyway, we can, we can. Sorry. Yeah. By the way, this is. This is Dries, I just joined. Hey, Dries. Hey, Dries. Hey. So, uh, happy birthday, Dries. You guys, I just want to be mindful of time that we have about 10 minutes left and another big topic to get through. Um, so we'd be happy to take more like specific DrupalCon feedback, uh, but I think it'd be great if we could, uh, you know, feel free to email Rachel or yeah. both of us to do that, um, unless anyone has any bigger picture questions for DrupalCon right now. Okay. Should we move on to the next topic? Yay! Okay. Thanks. I really appreciate that, Donna. <laughs> Good deal. Um, excellent. Thanks, Rachel, for all of that. And we'll talk to you again in an executive session. Um, and I think we'll turn things over to, and it looks like you've got the uh, screen sharing going. I should be able to do this. Great. And so for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting Tim yet, meet Tim Lennon, or Tim Prime, as we call him around here. Hi. Tim is awesome. He is our project manager, and maybe, I don't think I'll be hurting anyone's feelings if I say that Tim may be everyone's favorite person to work with at the association. Oh, Tim, high oh, praise. Uh, bombshell. <laughs> I guess I have a lot to live up to. Um, so I want to talk about um, community initiatives for Drupal.org and uh, a new proposal for how we engage with community contributors. Uh, so I will step through the slides here. Um, basically, when we looked into how we wanted to engage with community going forward, we wanted to make sure that we were operating with clear principles and goals about what we want this process to be and what it should accomplish. So obviously the kind of leading principles is that the DA itself needs to continue to assume the role of the maintainers and initiative leads of what happens on Drupal.org, um, which is something that's been a transition for the community to understand that we're trying to create a co consistent, coherent experience across Drupal.org and we love their contributions, uh, but want to make sure that they align with all the work we did last year on the content strategy and a lot of the initiatives that we're already trying to uh, move forward. Um, so we want to make sure that that vision is consistent, that it's possible, um, and that we can be responsible as the maintainers uh, of Drupal.org um, and have our own prioritization process retain its integrity. Um, so goals um, for this new process are to enable positive contributions by the community um, in a better way. Um, we've struggled in some cases to do that well. It's a problem that we know we have and it's an ongoing challenge. Um, and there are also some great examples um, of us working with the community for major initiatives and minor initiatives that have gone very well. So obviously Drupal CI was a huge, huge, huge issue. It was the a, a blocker to Drupal 8. It's a massive testing infrastructure. And that um, was a wonderful learning experience and a good opportunity to work on an initiative closely with the community. We kicked that off with the Drupal 8 Accelerate Sprint um, here in Portland, and then gradually kind of took on more of that initiative, more of that direction. We had regular bi-weekly conversations with the community folks that were involved. So it was 
it was a good experience, and we're modeling a lot of what I'm kind of proposing as our way to interact with community initiatives based on that experience um, and what we learned from it. Um, and you know, one of the interesting things about Triple CS Community Initiative is it was really a kind of six month process of starting from this um, uh, this place where we're supporting where we're supporting the community through a primarily community led sprint to creating it as a production service and now refining it um, and uh, taking it beyond adding new features, things like that. So, and we've also had some other great community initiatives that were uh, of smaller scope um, that, that went really well. So in doing these community initiatives, the other key factor is we want to preserve the goodwill of the community by having staff involved in this kind of maintainer role before the contributors start the work. Um, so that we don't have to come to a contributor who's created a huge body of code or documentation or uh, UX mockups or something and say, oh, I wish we'd seen this sooner. We have this whole set of things from our content strategy or this whole set of things that we then have to rationalize after they've put their heart and soul into something for us. So we really want to respect uh, their time and their volunteerism um, with our process. So, and part of that is going to be making our how we allocate resources to community initiatives more transparent. Um, we need to make sure that contributions are, again, they cohere with that greater vision, they cohere with the mission of Drupal.org, and we want this process to be as low overhead as we can make it because we're working with limited staff, um, and we need to, we don't want to turn this into a big new platform for ideation on Drupal.org. Uh, we just want it to be a kind of lean way to provide more transparency and have a way to prioritize community initiatives. So to get into the details, once we have those goals, we want this to be um, applicable both to code contributions and non-code contributions. We don't want it to be too burdensome for smaller scope contributions that would be quick wins for Drupal.org. And we also want to be able to accommodate contributors who aren't coming with an idea in hand, but just want to find some way to help out. Um, so, uh, with those goals in mind, uh, here's a rough outline of what this process would look like. Um, essentially, in the, in the normal way, the community formulates some new idea in the issue queues. Um, a particular community member says, hey, I can contribute by implementing that idea. Um, this is where things would start to change. What we would do is say, we, we'd like that user to submit, or, or the users, if there are a few people who want to work on that together, to submit a short proposal through a form on our roadmap. Um, we can evaluate those proposals monthly and communicate with um, these uh, potential contributors about whether we're going to accept, reject, or postpone those proposals based on whether or not they meet already prioritized work, if they represent a quick win, um, or if we feel that they're important enough and needed uh, widely enough by the community that we want to elevate them into the roadmap. Um, if we accept one of those proposals, we'd like to have a liaison from the EDA staff to coordinate with the contributor going forward uh, throughout kind of the life cycle of that community contribution. And that's an example that we have used. I kind of stood in that role personally for Drupal CI, for example, but we've done that in a number of other cases on a kind of ad hoc basis. And it's worked very well. So um, that way we have a single sort of point of contact who can, again, act as a maintainer and help make sure that the requirements and um, the UX and what, whatever the kind of scope of the project is actually going to align with the rest of the initiatives and uh, product vision for Drupal.org. So um, we'll, we would then monitor that work as it's ongoing. Some of these projects might take a very short time, some of them might take a long time. If that work is, um, you know, if it's a code-based uh, contribution and it gets to the state where the contributor thinks it's basically ready to deploy, we will try and have that review um, of the code and, and kind of prioritize that for deployment within the quarter uh, of that completion. Now, that's not a promise that if someone proposes an idea, we're going to complete it a quarter later. That's for something that's already been accepted, already had a liaison, and gets to the point where it's on a dev site and they think it's ready to go. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, uh, kind of a key part of making this smoother is the fact that the dev sites are now a 10 minute build process. So it's much easier for someone to start sketching out an idea um, in a development environment. So anyway, the process is similar for a contributor that doesn't have a particular feature in mind. It's a slightly different thing. Um, we've had an example of this. Um, 
in the past. Um, but basically, if there's a uh, contributor that comes to us and says, I want to find a way to get back to Drupal or Drupal Association or Drupal.org, but they don't know what it is they want to do, we first we want to encourage them that they can ask us for some direction. And generally speaking, we're probably going to encourage them to contribute in some way to Drupal, the software, rather than to Drupal.org. However, if their particular interests in contribution kind of align particularly well with Drupal.org, um, then we get some information uh, using a similar web form roadmap on their background and availability. Um, this is not intended to be kind of a, you know, we'll train up newcomers on how to make their first contribution, but kind of a, when we have a really experienced person who wants to, to do this as a way of giving back and it, it aligns really well, we want to have that opportunity to work with them. Again, we would have a DA, DA staff liaison who would be the contact point to that person to help project manage whatever work they're doing. And we would look at our roadmap to find work um, that is appropriate to their skill level and the kind of contribution that they'd like to make. So um, the minimum implementation to actually kind of get this moving um, is to update our roadmap uh, page to uh, display the proposed and prioritized community initiatives and their status right alongside the existing Drupal Association priorities. It would include that web form for submitting your proposal. That's where you would say, here's the issue where we've been talking about this. Um, here's some key details that we would like to have from them. Here's you know, our availability to be a contributor, what, how many hours a week we can, we can do things. Um, and it would have some documentation of what, that, what this whole process looks like so they have an expectation of what's involved. Um, and I want to point out that if we do this through this kind of web form format, the goal is not to take that work out of the issue queues where the community is used to working. That's for kind of our evaluation and prioritization. Once we have prioritized work, that's going to be working in the issue queues like all the other community initiatives like Drupal CI did um, and all of that. So just as a clarification. Um, this, the reason that this is so minimal, it's just some updates to the roadmap page and a web form is just because we don't, like I said, we don't want to create a whole new ideation tool on Drupal.org. We just want to provide a way to create that transparency and an easy way to find the process to become a contributor who can work with us. Um, so obviously, this is not all on the community shoulders. There's a lot of staff commitments that we have to make in order to make this a process that will that will, the community can have confidence in and feel like they um, uh, decisions about acceptance and rejection are not arbitrary and uh, that they have a decent sense of the, a reasonable time frame for us trying to help incorporate their work. So um, our commitment or our proposal for what we would try and do is review uh, new proposals on at least a monthly basis just for that initial uh, prioritization of whether that's something we can accept, reject, or postpone. We would then say, okay, this is something that aligns well with our next quarter of work that we have prioritized, or it's dependent on another initiative, and therefore we can get started on it once that initiative is across the finish line. Um, we have that DA staff liaison being assigned to uh, set up a biweekly communication with the community member or community members who want to be doing this contribution. And then when that's completed, we will have to commit to, to doing uh, our integration testing, necessary performance testing, security review, um, and we'll work out those details, coordinate those details, because it's going to be different in scope for the different kinds of contributions during those bi-weekly meeting processes, and just according to the normal way that we do change management and deployment for features. Um, so I ran through that pretty quick because we were uh, kind of running out of time, but does anyone have questions or, or feedback about that process? You're all still there, right? So, yep. so uh, who who are the uh, who are the liaisons that you think uh, from the association uh, will be will be uh, will be assigned? What uh, what uh, individuals would those be? That's a good question. So it it will vary slightly depending on the nature of the contribution. So in some cases, it might be myself um, as a project manager for the engineering team here. It, makes sense in a lot of cases for me to kind of project manage a community contribution that fits into some other initiative that the rest of the staff is working on. In other cases, it might make sense for it to be Tatiana, particularly if it's related to 
um, something to do with kind of the, the product itself or you know documentation structure or how the support system should work on Drupal or those kinds of things. Um, if it's an infrastructural contribution, it may be someone like uh, Ryan on the infrastructure team or Rudy on the infrastructure team. So it'll depend a little bit on the nature of the contribution. There aren't that many of us, so, but. Um, and, and one of the goals you said was creating a low overhead process for managing these community initiatives. Um, that's, that's where my, my worry w would come in, that, uh, that if, uh, if, uh, if this is um, successful, um, and I think it could be, um, we may find ourselves in a position where, where staff are way overburdened and aren't able to, to focus on this and their other day-to-day -day, uh, um, uh, responsibilities. Is, has there been any discussion on that? Uh, certain, I mean, I would say that that is the, probably the biggest thing that we're concerned about. So it's the, certainly the most important risk um, to this process that we've identified. It's, um, it's weighed against the risk of not having a standardized way to interact with or accept proposed community features, right? So we're, we're, we're balancing that risk against this risk of not having a, a, a normal way to say yes or no that doesn't appear totally arbitrary to the community. Yeah. So part of this is a way to give us integrity when we have to say no, to say, Here's this process. Here's the transparent um, order of priority. Here's you know the number of resources and where they are. And so at times when we have to say no or not yet, we'll be able to do that in a way that is hope hopefully feels less arbitrary to the community. Um, yeah. There's places where we've had to do that before, and a lot of people are very upset. But there's other places where you know people can under, kind of understand, but there, isn't, there hasn't been this kind of like central way of understanding, okay, this is because it's part of a larger process of a, a great prioritization. So we're hoping that will help, right? There will be sour grapes here and there. That's not something we'll ever be able to eliminate, but we want to at least be able to say that when we, we're saying no, we're saying no with integrity based on a, a transparent prioritization process. Thanks, Tim. Other questions or observations? Looks good to me. Thanks, Mike. Sounds great to me, too. Oh, good. Excellent. I can talk if you want me to talk, but <laughs> I, thought I'd, I thought I would avoid uh, throwing, hurling random questions. <laughs> But this was one of the uh, the requests for kind of next steps for how we uh, proceed with working groups. And so um, I guess my request on this is if it's, it's pretty much agreed that this is a good process, then we're going to take this to the, the working group members that um, were kind of involved in the, the workshop that we did in Barcelona. We'll walk through the process with them, get some additional feedback, um, and then begin the process of publishing that, uh, which means probably in the January time frame. Um, maybe as early as December, more likely January, uh, we'd be coming back with the conversation of next steps for working groups, which uh, if we follow the recommendations that came out of Barcelona, that would be um, dissolving them, basically, and, and, and establishing different ways of, of interacting. Well, plus one from me. Okay. Awesome. Josh, do you anticipate that this will be a surprise to any of those, those existing working group members? It sounds like no. you're socializing it. We, we, we definitely talked about it and uh, it was it was part of the conversation in Barcelona so almost everyone in Barcelona everyone that was there from the working bar groups in Barcelona are prepared for this uh, and because it only affects the Drupal.org working groups um, that's also been um, heavily socialized yeah. uh, there's Great, the thanks. working group documentation working group community uh, working group those all continue to operate as they have been this would just be Drupal.org content, Drupal.org software, and Drupal.org infrastructure. Okay. Definitely feel free to share any thoughts that you may have later. Um, I know you know how to get a hold of Josh if you don't know how to get a hold of Tim. Um, but uh, I think it's 10 after, and we do have a few things to tackle in executive sessions, so it probably makes sense for us to move into that. Um, we're in new software right now, so the first thing that we should do is stop the recording. Recording 